Hi, welcome to episode two of Anglican Aesthetics. In this video, I want to cover something that's really close to my heart. It's probably the uh, theological topic I'm most excited to unpack um, because it's, a, it's at the center of Christian faith. It's at the center of, of everything we do here. Um, it's at the center of everything we believe as Christians. And the topic is the Trinity. So you've probably heard, and rightfully so, that the Trinity is a mystery. It is incomprehensible because the God we worship is absolutely incomprehensible. So how can we go about articulating the Trinity then to those who don't know it, to those who want to know more about it? If it's this incomprehensible mystery, do we just say there are three persons and, and one God and we'll just sort of leave it at there and, and you know not say anything else? Well, we can't do that, right? There are substantive objections to the doctrine of the Trinity. There are significant concerns that Muslims or non-Christians might have with the doc doctrine of the Trinity, with whether it's coherent. And in fact, there's a lot of beauty in pressing into the depths of the mystery of the Trinity. That's not to say we can exhaust the depths of this mystery. We can't. Uh, there are conceptual categories that aren't accessible to us because we're finite creatures. We're, we're small, we're limited. You know, we can't, as as I think C.S. Lewis's analogy um, for this, which I really, really quite like, uh, was the analogy of being a sort of 2D stick figure trying to comprehend a cube, right? The 2D stick figure really doesn't have the sort of conceptual hardware to fully grasp a cube. But it can sort of get glimpses and, and analogies and faint glimmers of what a cube would be like. Well, similarly... In our finitude, we can try to get a glimpse of the Trinity, and we'll find that the small glimpses that we can get, even in our finitude, are absolutely dazzlingly beautiful. So what is the doctrine of the Trinity? I'll give a brief overview, and then I'll link more uh, resources that you can access in the YouTube channel um, in the description box. But as we understand and think about the doctrine of the Trinity, we need a basic definition. Well, the Trinity says that there exists one and one God alone. In Deuteronomy 6.4, the Bible says that the Lord is one. Yahweh and Yahweh alone is our one God. We worship him above any other deity. And in fact, we acknowledge him to be the only true deity. So Yahweh alone is our God. But there's a second part of the doctrine of the Trinity. While there is one God, this God exists, or to use the classical terminology, subsists as three divine persons. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. The Church Fathers... Uh, the early Christians within the first five centuries of Christianity, as they were wrestling with the best way to articulate the biblical data, to systematize it, and to give a coherent articulation of what they were seeing in the text, came up with this sort of grammar. There is one essence. God is one in essence, one divine essence or substance or being. And there are three divine persons. Okay, so what, what is an essence? What is being? Well, to give the simplest definition of it, being or essence or substance denotes what you are. Okay, so if someone were to ask you, what are you? You'd say you are a human being, right? I'd say I'm a human being. Now, we don't share the same essence, at least not in the same sense that God is one in essence, even though we're the same kind of essence. Okay, so we're the same, we, we share a common nature in the sense that both of us are humans, but we're also two different human beings. Now, when we think about the three persons sharing one essence, we're not talking about them simply sharing one common nature, like you and I share 
one common human nature. We're talking about a unity that's much more fundamental. You and I are distinguishable as two human beings or two human essences. In God, there is only one essence, one divine being. The three persons are not merely individuals of the same kind of nature. They share the very same nature. And so the church fathers spoke of uh, the persons as having one existence. Well, well what, what does that mean, right? Well, if we think about this, Abraham Lincoln had a different existence than you or me, right? In the sense that he existed at a different time. His existence is different than my existence. And your existence is different than my existence. But within God, there is only one divine existence, one power, right? One, uh, one will, even, the fathers talked about. How can there only be one will? How do, how do we think about this? Well, my wife and I, we, we partake in a lot of, of things together, right? We, we might have a common purpose that unites our common works. That is not what we mean by uh, the persons uh, being united in one will. We don't mean that the persons sh simply have a common purpose or they're doing the same activity, right? So I can be flipping an egg and my wife can be flipping an egg right alongside me. And, and we can talk about that in, in human language as us doing the same thing. That is not what we mean when we talk about God being one in will. We mean there is one action attributable to all, all three divine persons. So what, whatever God does in creation, in the act of creating, all three persons are actually fully and completely uh, uh, the performers or the performer in, in the sense that they're one in essence of that work. So if God creates a world, he creates, to use both the biblical and the traditional terminology, through the Son, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and by the Spirit. The Spirit broods over the face of the deep in Genesis 1 and gives life to all things through the book of Job and throughout Scripture. So the Father, in, in all that our one God does, every single work proceeds from the Father through the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there is an inseparability of the persons in all that they do. And furthermore, this unity is so complete that the persons fully indwell one another. They mutually indwell one another. Okay, so one way to think about this is the idea of overlapping circles. Now, this isn't a perfect analogy. There are ways in which this analogy will, will break down. But if you imagine sort of two overlapping circles, right, that common area <laughs> that they share sort of mutually inhabits each circle. The persons completely overlap without losing their distinctiveness from one another. So whenever I encounter the Holy Spirit, then, I encounter the Father and Son fully present in the Holy Spirit. Whenever I encounter the Son, I encounter the Son fully through the power of the Holy Spirit, and I encounter the Father in the Son. <laughs> Whenever I approach the throne of the Father, I draw near to the Father through the Son and by the Spirit. So there's an inseparability of operations, of works, attributable to the persons of the Trinity. So then what are persons? You can sort of think about this as who, right? As who language. So if someone were to ask you who you are, you'd tell me your name. If someone were to ask me who I am, I'd, I'd say Sean. Now, part of the reason this language is imperfect is because I, when someone asks me that question, Sean, and someone asks my wife the question of who she is, Sophia, right? We're two individuals and we have two different existences. So intuitively, we, we associate the question of who-ness with different existences or different essences. So while there are three in God who share the identity of Yahweh, 
we don't want to think of these as three individuals, right? There is communication in the being of God, but not as sort of separate or even separable individuals. The persons of the Trinity could never exist apart from each other. So how do we further press into this, right? Well, here's the mystery uh, that, that sort of helps us get our minds around. Okay, how can, how can each person be, be fully present in one another? Well, in the early church, there is a doctrine that's rooted in John 1 and Hebrews 1, 3 of, called the eternal generation of the Son, right? The processions of the persons. Okay, what, what is that? What in the world does eternal generation mean? Well, the way they went about trying to, to uh, wrap their minds around this was by noting that in Scripture, Scripture spoke of the Son as the Word of the Father. So there's this image of a Word going forth from the Father in Scripture, and that Word itself being the eternal Son. In Hebrews 1.3, it talks about the eternal Son as the radiance of the Father's glory. So if, th if you think about how we see the sun in the sky, right? It's a burning ball of fire, but we only see that burning ball of fire by its radiance that reaches us on earth. Now, let's think and assume, right, just, just to give us the sort of conceptual categories, that the sun had been shining from eternity. The, the physical sun in the sky. Okay, so the rays of light then, right, while eternally sort of, as it were, emanating from the sun, would never have come into existence. If the sun was always shining from eternity, there would have never been a time where the rays were not, right? So to say the sun of God, the eternal sun of God, is eternally generated, is to say that the Father from eternity gives all that he is in, in sheer self-giving love to the Son. The Son receives his sonship from the Father. By, he is a son by virtue of being the Son of the Father, and he receives his very whatness. He is begotten from the Father, and he returns all things to the Father. So there is this sort of cyclical motion of... of uh, deity in eternal motion in god where where deity goes from the father to the son and from the son back to the father and to speak of the son then as eternally generated is to speak of the son as being the one who is from the father and he is fully from the father he is not supported and subordinate in any way he receives the fullness of deity from the Father eternally. So there was never a time where the Father was like, ah, I guess we'll just choose to give this to the Son. The Father is the Father in giving all of that he is and all that he has to the Son. And the Son is eternally the Son in receiving that the, all that the Father is and returning it all back to the Father. Well, what, what analogies sort of help us get our minds around this. And and if that's true, if deity is this motion of love between father and son, what need is there for the Holy Spirit? Well, the most helpful analogy in the early church, uh, and I think it's a biblical analogy, is the analogy of love. When you think about love, the nature of love, there is a lover, one who is the actor of love. There is the loved, the object of that love. And then there is the relationship, the love itself that characterizes that love. So what, what is this, what, what, what does that look like in, in human experience? Well, again, when I think about my relationship with my wife, I'm in that relationship, right? Relative to her, I'm, I love her. She's the object of my love. And then there's the relationship we share right? And that relationship, we talk about it sort of in modern culture as a, a kind of vibe. If you've ever been around a couple that are like so super into each other that like excludes everyone else, kind of makes you feel sick and gross. 
like from the from their relationship, you can almost get a sense of who these two people are, right? From the way they act together, you start to know something about them. So their relationship reveals something about their their person. Well, the early church, one of the analogies then that was given, and again, this is an imperfect analogy. There are ways in which this analogy breaks down. But was this idea that the son is the fullness of the father's love. He's the loved one. And that back and forth of deity then is so complete because the father and son love each other so completely with the very same love that the vibe of their relationship um, is actually personal because their relationship between one another is so complete and so full that it stands forth as a third person, the Holy Spirit. Another analogy I found helpful, but, but this again is a limited analogy, is, is sort of the one given by Jonathan Edwards. And he's sort of following Augustine and Thomas Aquinas before him in giving this analogy. He asks us to conduct a thought experiment. So imagine that you relived every single one of your experiences that you went through in the past hour. Okay, so that's that's interesting. So imagine then I could relive my entire life that I lived the hour before right now, right? So I, I could have this perfect experience of what's going on around me. And then within my mind, within my consciousness, I am also simultaneously reliving the life I lived um, in the past hour. So if you think about the father contemplating his perfections perfectly, there would stand forth a perfect idea of his perfections that is so full and so complete that it stands forth as a personal, um, a personal idea, the very wisdom and thought of God. God the Father sees this complete idea and loves this complete idea because God is the source of all beauty and all that's good. So if God loves what is good, he is loving the emanations of his own perfections. And so he loves them, the fullness of this idea that stands forth as a complete idea uh, with the fullness of love. That idea then being the Son and the fullness of love being the Spirit. Now that breaks down because the Son, of course, is more than just an idea. He's not less than the Father's view of his own perfections, but he's more than that. He's one to whom the Father relates. But it gives you a sort of faint glimmer of how it is within one essence, within one sort of thing or substance. In this analogy from Edwards, in one consciousness, you can have three sort of subsistences or three who relate within that one consciousness. Right? If I were to recontemplate my my past life or my, my past hour, not my past life, my past hour, um, and, and relive it perfectly, if I could communicate with that idea, we get something a little closer to the Trinity. Not quite there, but something just that's just a little bit closer. Um that that starts to get us this picture of okay, how how it is that that there can be three persons in one God in one divine substance. So to sum that all up, right, the Son is eternally generated from the Father. The, the, uh, the Son receives, his deity receives all that he is from the Father and returns it to the Father. And the Spirit is this back and forth of love personifying their relationship and this movement of love that is God, that is the divine essence, has always gone on. There was never a moment when this wasn't, and therefore there was never a moment where the Son came into existence. So though he is eternally begotten, that doesn't mean he had a temporal beginning. That means he received his all from the Father that he loves. Okay, so why does this doctrine matter? Well, this, this seems abstract to this point, but why does it matter? Well, here's what it means about reality. If if God is the ultimate foundation of all that is, that means the ultimate foundation of all that is, is literally love. 
the foundation of everything good and beautiful and true, if it's a reflection of the God who made it, who made this world, is a glimmer into an eternal life of love. So what is the deepest truth about reality? It is triune love. God is an eternal threefold movement of love. And it means that the riches that we see around us, if everything in creation was created to reflect the glory and goodness of God, everything good and, and beautiful and true and and awe-inspiring is actually a glimmer into the threefold life of love that God is. This affects everything. If God is most fundamentally love, and he created us in his own image to reflect him into the world, well, that means that we were created to reflect a life of love, a life of relationship. Why is it that human existence finds its telos, its completion, telos being the goal or that which fulfills the nature of a thing? Why is it that human nature finds its completion in relationship? There's a reason for that. And there's a reason for that, that, that naturalism, the view that all we are is physical stuff, cannot supply in a purely Darwinian view of the human self. And again, I'm not, I'm not uh, objecting to evolution in principle um, or the scientific theory of common descent. Uh, but if the, our origins can be explained solely, solely in terms of Darwinian evolution, then everything about us was shaped by natural selection, Right. So I came to be, and humanity came, comes to be, by virtue of random mutation that's selected for because some of those mutations uh, were advantageous to the survival of our ancestors uh, in their environments. So all, all of my features then are the, according to this story, solely the, the billions of years long process um, by which my faculties came to equip me to survive. Okay, so is that true? Well, if, if that's the deepest truth about humans, and there are some, some aspects of obviously human nature that, that accord with that. So I get thirsty, right, because I need water. Um, and so my faculty or, or the sort of affection or desire for thirst for water comes um, and was shaped because drinking water is, is advantageous to my survival. That makes sense. But here's one of the fundamental aspects of human nature that doesn't accord with that and is actually a better fitted to this idea of us being created in the image of the triune God. Suppose you had a friend, right? And you went to your friend's house and you guys ate together and laughed together. And you invited that friend over to your house. And you cooked a meal to, with that friend. And you laughed together. And suppose you found out that your friend viewed your laughing together as a means to the end of getting food from you. Okay, so they were just engaging relationship, asking you good questions. Because they thought you made really good, healthy, nutritious food. Why is it that you and I would feel used by that? That's really interesting. We feel that that's a perversion of relationship. Now, the Darwinian story tells us that, um, you know, we form social structures and social groups because that's advantageous to survival. And there's something to that. But that can't be true of every aspect of the way we experience even relationship, right? Right? Now, suppose someone were to say, well, you know, we, we evolved to experience, uh, to seek relationship as its own end, you know, uh, because that was the best way to sort of build social, social networks with each other. Okay, but psychologically then, why is it that psychologically we were formed in this way? 
such that non-exploitative, non-sort of instrumental relationships were the best kinds of relationships for us? Why is it that our psyche prefers non-instrumental relationships and we weren't happy with simply being instrumentalized? That doesn't make sense if the only story about us that can be told that explains the, the reason why we're here is Darwinism. Because if all of our faculties were shaped over time to equip us to survive, well then it seems like we wouldn't seek relationship as an end in itself. We would seek it as a means to survival. And there are other strange phenomena in our world that fall into this category. For example, we wouldn't seek beautiful things in themselves if uh, we were solely shaped for survival. We, it seems like we would only sh seek beautiful things because we would see some sort of instrumental benefit that would, that would equip us to survive. But clearly that's, that's the wrong use of beauty and that's certainly the wrong use of persons. That's really interesting. So it seems then that, that with a meal, when I share a meal with a person, the way I'm ordered to experience that meal is in a non-instrumental, well, instrumental relative to the meal, but I experience the person rather non-instrumentally. What does that mean? That means the meal is a means to enhance my relationship with another person, not the other way around. This is a really good fit if the most fundamental truth about us is that we were created in the image of a God who is relationship at his heart. Okay, so what's what's another thing that, that sort of makes sense about our world? Well, the persons mutually indwell each other. And a truth that native religions, eastern religions have picked up on that Christians need not wholly repudiate is that it seems like the world is mutually dependent, right? So for example, a tree doesn't exist in isolation. A tree exists by taking in, taking in oxygen and sunlight from its surroundings and returning that to its surroundings. I exist by virtue of a unitive act from my parents, which in turn, and I depend on food, and I, I also contribute back to the relationship, right? So, so the world has this shape where things sort of co-inhere in each other. Well, wouldn't that fit really well if the God who made the world is in himself the perfect coherence of love? The persons perfectly and completely indwell one another without ever eliminating each other's distinctiveness. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. And yet, you cannot encounter any person without fully encountering the other persons. Well, if the world is a sort of dim echo, a dim shadow of the creator, that would be a good fit. <laughs> we could see how the creator or the creation would give sort of faint glimmers and glimpses into the life, the perfect life of love of our creator. And it means that reality at its core is fundamentally, foundationally personal. God did not make us because he needed us. He made us out of a sheer overflow of generosity. God did not need us to be love. So if we think about God, if he was just a solitary sort of monad, a, a completely unitarian being, one person, one being, right? We could not properly call him love. Well, why, why is that, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't God just be loving himself? Well, when we think about the nature of love, it seems to be other-oriented. It's this expression of gift, of giving myself. Well, if there was no creation, who did the Unitarian God, this monadic God, give himself to? It would seem that that God would actually need creation to be love. God did not create us because he needed something to give himself to. Our very existence is an overflow of the generosity in God's own being. 
It's an overflow of God's super abundant life. In God, he has everything he needs. He is perfectly satisfied in love and in all of the beauty and goodness that characterizes the love that he is. So he creates us then as a sheer act of overflowing generosity. There are many other ways in which the Trinity matters, and Lord willing, we, we will unpack those uh, on this channel. But to sum up this, the foundation of the doctrine, God is one in essence. He is one in whatness. And he's not one in essence in the same way that you and I are one in essence, in the same way that we share a human nature. Rather, God is one and purely one in divine essence. The persons do not merely share a common nature. They are and exist as and are fully the one divine essence. Each person fully possessing in themselves the fullness of divine life. The fullness of all that God is. And we can speak about the persons as sharing one divine essence. We just have to be careful to note that that's different than saying you and I share one common nature. So there's one divine essence. There are three persons, or in other words, there are three who exist in the one divine essence, or rather three in whom that one divine essence exists, and three who exist together and co-inhere in one another and communicate with each other eternally and exist in a relationship of love. There are three who exist in and as ones who are loved by each other. So there's one God. There are three, three distinct ones whom we can identify as God. And each person is fully God. And these persons are not each other. All things are from him, through him, and to him. All things are from the Father, through the Son, and brought to their completion by the Holy Spirit. And all things in heaven and on earth are being returned by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the redemptive work of the Son, to the Father, as a, as a gift. This is the glorious trinity, and this is the life of love into which we have all been invited and to which you can be united through Jesus Christ. Amen.